Next speaker uh, you've heard from before, and that's John Marini from St. Paul's. And uh, John is going to tell us about recruitment maneuvers. There were a lot of questions today and yesterday about recruitment maneuvers. What's the best way to do it? How do you do it? Open lung approach. We're going to get all those answers in the next 29 minutes. I'd like to take this opportunity, uh, because it's the last time I'll talk with you, um, to thank again our sponsors and Dr. Slutsky and our co-chairman um, for really an exciting event, and I was very glad to be with you. My topic this, uh, this morning is recruitment maneuvers to achieve an open lung, and the subtitle is whether to do them, and if so, how to do them. Now, I'd like to uh, cover some basic principles, some methods for recruitment, and to cover some experimental studies and clinical trials regarding the efficacy and hazards of recruitment maneuvers. And I'll start in a purely clinical way. In China, you may not know the musical called Fiddler on the Roof. It's a play musical play, and an 18-year-old girl who came under my care fell from a high position on the stage, broke her leg, needed it reset, developed fulminant ARDS. She was cared for in our surgical unit, and late on a Saturday night, a resident came to me and said, Dr. Marini, you had better see this woman because she was just told, her parents were just told, she is going to die and there's nothing that can be done for her. She was on 20 centimeters of water peep, 100% oxygen. To make a very uh, interesting story for me, much shorter for you, recruitment maneuvers were done. She was turned to the prone position and the patient recovered within 34 hours and her parents were extremely grateful. There is no question in my mind that recruitment maneuvers can be life-saving. And I'll try to introduce you to why I think that's true, show you how that should be done, and close with another clinical example right at the end. My encouragement to try recruiting maneuvers in the prone position came from an experiment that I was doing in the uh, animal laboratory. One week earlier, at the conclusion of the day's experiment, the animal had a PO2 of 58 on 20 centimeters of water peep, 100% oxygen, oleic acid injury. My technician and friend said, John, we've finished all the protocol for the day. Is there anything else you'd like to try? And it was about 3.30 in the afternoon. The pig was just barely alive. And I said, Alex, please turn the, patient, the pig to the prone position and then repeat the recruiting maneuvers. This is where the pig was turned to the prone position and the PO2 rose very modestly. At this point, we increased PEEP to 30 centimeters of water. And you cannot read the time scale very well, but this is 3.45 in the afternoon, and this is 4 o'clock, and this is 4.15. The PO2 rose progressively to a value of 628 millimeters of mercury. The PCO2, which was in the uh, about 70 millimeter of mercury range, fell down to 52.8, partly because we added tracheal gas insufflation to the uh, experiment, and the pH rose as well. The animal, blood pressure, fine, Oxygenation, perfect, only intervention, recruitment maneuver. What recruitment maneuver was it? It was simply increasing PEEP and keeping the driving pressure the same, the same tidal volume. 
and I'll come back to that theme at the end. Remember we talked yesterday about how excessive mechanical stress inflames the lung. We talked about overstretching, we talked about shearing forces, and we talked about airway trauma. We talked about the risk being greatest right at the boundary of open and closed lung units because the tension is the greatest in those positions and because opening and closure is most likely to be damaging. We've also heard many times that lungs in ARDS are heterogeneous with some lung units perpetually open and some lung units completely consolidated and closed and they are on different parts of their own individual pressure volume relationships. Measuring one simple airway pressure hides a great deal of information. We'll come back to that point in a minute. If we are thinking about the tissue most at risk, it's the tissue that is collapsible but recruitable by the tidal pressures that we're using. When those tidal pressures are very high, the dangers are great. Remember this slide. This is the damaged area of these lungs which were overinflated and very little PEEP was used. The stretched areas were almost normal visually and almost normal under the microscope. The dependent areas of this supine animal were hemorrhagically inflamed. What we're trying to do is homogenize the lung and prevent the collapsible areas from being collapsed. Some people get confused about the relationship between plateau pressure and end expiratory pressure. What is the relative importance? And some very brilliant people have concentrated only on tidal volume, only on plateau pressure, or only on PEEP as the variable of interest. And the fact is they're interactive very much like a balance. If we're trying to keep tissue strain low, think of PEEP as being the fulcrum of the balance. Plateau pressure minus PEEP being the driving pressure and the lever on strain. If we increase plateau pressure I'm sorry, that didn't come out very well. The plat if plateau pressure goes out to the end of the uh, balance, what we find, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, can we go back a little bit, please? Okay. Here's plateau pressure. If plateau pressure goes out to the end, the uh, strain becomes excessive the lever arm propels strain into a very high level and damage can result. Next. If PEEP is raised, the lever arm is made shorter and fewer lung units are at risk for damage. The simple point of this illustration is that it's an interactive behavior between plateau pressure and PEEP. We need to recruit the lung to minimize the number of lung units at risk and we'd like to keep the difference between plateau pressure and PEEP at an acceptable level. Plateau pressure may turn out to be a fairly high value and still not be damaging. This is hopeless. <laughs> okay, remember in our heterogeneous lung, and this I have modified from Gattinoni. In certain regions, we have consolidated lung tissue 
that cannot be opened by any pressure that we choose to use. If we're talking about an open lung, we're not talking about making cells and fluid disappear. There may be only 8%, maybe up to 30% of all lung units potentially openable by any pressure. It's those lung units that are at risk. Those lung units that involve alveolar collapse or small airway collapse. And the reason for making the distinction is that small airway collapse only requires 10 to 20 centimeters of water to reverse. If you have absorption collapse, as many of you know, it may take as much as 60 centimeters of water or even more in a diseased lung to open the lung. And this is very important and confusing in the literature. You can't open all of the lung and the pressures that you require may vary anywhere from 10 to 15 centimeters of water to get all of the lung open or most of the lung open to 60 to 80 centimeters of water to open the lung. Question, should the lung always be opened? Should we always aim for a low open lung? I'm sure we'll get controversy on that. But remember, primary ARDS injured from the alveolar side may be less recruitable than secondary ARDS. Recruitable lung units may comprise less than 10% of the computed tomography density that we see. So we may be trying very hard for something that affects only a small population of lung units. Might be very important, but still a small population. The earlier stage is more recruitable than the later stages generally. The need to avoid tidal opening and closure may depend on the plateau pressure. If you understand that balance if I have a low plateau pressure, I may have opening and closing occurring in small airways. In fact, in congestive heart failure and obesity, people do this all the time. We listen, we hear crackles. They don't damage their lungs. They're not generating transalveolar forces that are very high. Their plateau pressure is not way out on that balance. So opening and closure by itself, important if plateau pressure is high and those lung units open at high pressure. Not all atelectasis can be reversed. Even if I open the lung, it may close again. I might be able to open at 60, but some of those lung units are going to collapse at 55 and 50, and an unacceptable level of PEEP. It's quite, it's quite complex, and it varies from patient to patient. So if you want to remember one slide, remember this one, please. How was the injured lung best recruited? In my view, prone position, for reasons I'll cover, adequate PEEP, adequate tidal volume, or if you're not going to use an adequate tidal volume, use Dr. Pazenti's technique of using an intermittent sigh with a very small tidal volume. Recruiting maneuvers are essential in setting PEEP. Minimize lung edema to minimize the amount of collapsed lung tissue. Use the lowest acceptable FiO2 to prevent absorption collapse which will then require high pressures to reopen that tissue. And spontaneous efforts, we talked about these yesterday. Ideally, yes, but if the patient is using expiratory musculature, it can be counterproductive. That's why these have question marks around them, unproven. Prone positioning. Is prone positioning very uncomfortable? I don't think so. I sleep prone. Is it? I shouldn't have said that. No. Uh, some people sleep supine. 
but most of us sleep on our side or semi-prone. You can make it look very natural for the patient to be in a prone position if you haven't tried it. And there is a number of advantages to the prone position. I think most of you know your airways drain better. There's a more uniform gradient of transalveolar pressure, especially in patients with ARDS in the prone position. The heart, instead of being suspended by the uh, dependent lung, is actually resting more on the breastbone. So the lungs can expand away as they inflate. And interestingly enough, this is a theoretical advantage, but may explain why prolonged prone positioning improves oxygenation over time. The lymphatic drainage would expect, be expected to be better in the prone position because the heart sinks in relationship to the center of gravity of the lungs, of the heavy lungs. Lymphatics improve their function. Now, in experiments that Dr. Gatnoni's colleague uh, Pelosi did with us and that they also did in Milan in a parallel study in adults, we looked at quantitative CT scanning as a function of pressure and total lung capacity, and this is in oleic acid injured dogs. It's published two papers back to back, one in dogs, one in humans, in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. Inflation limb. Notice that dependent density reduces as we go to total lung capacity to the point where the air tissue density virtually goes to its maximum and you can hardly see any optical evidence of water in the lung. Is the water gone? I don't think so. Is the density changed? Yes. Is the recruitment? Likely so, yes. And if you look at the percentages, this is 100% of the total available uh, amount of consolidated tissue. At a level of 35 centimeters of water, look at this. You still have 20% of your collapsible lung units still to be opened by higher pressure. And many people think oleic acid is a very recruitable form of lung injury. But you still haven't opened the whole lung until you go to 60 centimeters of water. Now, if you look at the recruitment curve and the v pressure volume relationship, here's what you see. This is the inspiratory pressure volume relationship. Here is the inspiratory recruitment percentage. So is the inspiratory limb of the PV curve devoid of information of interest? No, I don't think so. Because as you approach the flat part of the inspiratory PV curve, you're approaching the pressure which opens most of the openable tissue. It gives you a guide as to what kind of pressure you need mechanically to open the lung. This is from my uh, colleague, uh, Mar co colleague, I wish he were still my colleague, but he worked with us for a while, Marcelo Amato, looking at electrical impedance tomography. Think of this as volume, think of this as, um, uh, or, or um, uh, the, the analog of pressure volume relationship. Here you see that in the lower section of the lung, you do not begin to, to have impedance rise and aeration occur until you're reaching very high levels of volume. In the upper lung, you are almost completely open at a much lower lung volume, approximately half of the, 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 the total volume that goes in. If you look overall at the total lung, you may be misled into thinking that you're still on a perfectly linear and acceptable pressure volume relationship. Point is that the 
single measurement that we can make does not necessarily reflect the behavior in the two sections of the heterogeneous lung. Full recruitment needs high pressure. We've already talked about that. But if that's true, how much collapse is dangerous? And I alluded to my answer to this question a little earlier. If I look at this position and say, here's an acceptable plateau pressure, it's 28 centimeters of water. Some people may think it's still a little bit dangerous. There's a lot of lung tissue still left at risk. So perhaps I should use a lower pressure. Well, here I have more lung units at risk, but I have a shorter lever arm on the balance. Which one is more dangerous? I'm not sure. I'd like to have all the lung recruited at a low pressure, but I may not be able to do that. It's always a trade-off. If you look at the study from Crotty and colleagues, which was the uh, patient analog of the study I just mentioned in, in dogs, here is the percentage of lung units opening, and here's the histogram of opening pressures. Most lung units in airways open by 20 centimeters of water. By 30 centimeters of water, you, you have most of the lung units completely opened. But there are many in these patients who had sepsis primarily who still have a considerable fraction of their recruitable lung units opening at high pressure. So if we look at the closing pressure curve, notice that some lung units begin to close at very high pressures, most of them close only at a pressure that's considerably lower than the pressure that opened them, which suggests that a recruiting maneuver might be quite informative and helpful. But what I point, want to point out to you is that some lung units cannot be kept open by any reasonable level of PEEP. You will still always have some lung units that remain closed. Now, Larger tidal volumes are said to be very poor for people, very bad for people. For example, here's tidal volume one, which is 22 centimeters of water, peep of 10, and we're in this range. But notice that there are lung units that can be opened by a higher tidal volume. In fact, many lung units that can be opened by a higher tidal volume. And some of those pressures at which that opening occurs are considered clinically acceptable. These are clinical data, remember. I'm pausing there because most of us think of small tidal volumes as always being beneficial. It depends. Depends on the plateau pressure that you achieve and the number of lung units at risk for damage. Higher tidal volumes can actually help recruitment. And it's also true that if these data hold up, some lung units may always be opening and closing. Here's a tidal volume. In these patients, 10 of, 10 of PEEP, 30 centimeters of water plateau pressure. This group of lung units may be undergoing cyclical collapse during the tidal cycle, whether or not we can hear it in the form of rails or ronchi. Simple concepts are helpful conceptually, but in real life, it's much more complex. Let me skip over that. Recruitment is time dependent. Of the two variables we've been talking about, pressure or time, I think pressure is more important. But time is also important. This is a, a paper from Katz and Fairley back in uh, the early part of the 1980s. They made a step change in pressure from 3 to 13 centimeters of water in PEEP. And they tracked what happened to FRC 
with subsequent breaths. These were not injured patients. These were post-operative patients. What do you see? With the first tidal volume, we get about 80% of where we eventually wind up after 11 to 20 breaths. It takes 11 to 20 breaths or approximately 40 seconds to reach the equilibration corresponding to a step change in PEEP. Remember Dr. Slutsky's illustration of the other day, how a tidal volume occurred and there was popping, pop, pop, pop. Some people think this is avalanche behavior and very complex mathematics explaining it could be true. But the time element should not be forgotten. And one reason why prone positioning may be very helpful is that for similar airway pressures, you're sustaining tractive forces for long periods of time. This is Dr. Slutsky's uh, illustration. I don't think it'll work here, but possibly it will. Um, could you, no, does not. Um, but l let me go on to, uh, uh, to uh, a statement that I think is very important. If you look at the inspiratory and expiratory pressure volume relationships, some would like to tell you that the theoretical effect of sustained inflation would be to take your pressure volume curve and move it to a higher lung volume. And in fact, that's exactly what does happen for a very short time. If you do not change positive end expiratory pressure, except in certain models like surfactant depletion, which is a very artificial model when we're talking about human adult ARDS. What will happen is, oh goodness, the animation is not working. It, 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 it works here. This tidal volume falls right back to its original position. If your recruitment maneuver is successful, you likely have to come back to a higher peep. And it's one reason why a recruitment maneuver is helpful in setting the appropriate level of PEEP. Do not believe studies at face value if they say they've done a recruitment maneuver, return to the original level of PEEP, and everything's better. It doesn't work that way in most patients. In some it does, but very few. Another important principle Beside that you have to go to total lung capacity and you have to raise PEEP to sustain your benefit, is that you may need multiple recruitment maneuvers to get the full effect or have to wait a very long time at high pressure to get the full effect. And this is a study that Bob Kazmarek and his colleagues published a few years ago showing uh, just that effect. That took four recruitment maneuvers to show the benefit that they eventually we're capable of showing. So the determinants of recruitment effectiveness are relative. It depends on the ARDS category. That determines the inherent potential for response. The ARDS stage, responsiveness diminishes over time. The starting peep and tidal volume. If you're already fully recruited to begin with, a recruitment maneuver is not going to help you. How much higher than the plateau pressure that you're now using is the recruiting pressure that you're trying to recruit with? And this is very important in the, in the ARDSnet trial, as I'll mention in just a minute. How many more lung units can be opened? The duration of the response is a function of the post-recruitment maneuver peep value, and the aggressiveness and type of recruiting method is important but that is often limited by tolerance of the patient and it varies among the uh, maneuvers that we use. Let's look at this thing, the starting peep and tidal volume, and let's look at the ARDSnet recruiting maneuvers trial. I maybe am I, I'm getting intolerant in my old age. Uh, I, I'm sure I am, in fact. But this was a damaging study 
well-intentioned but damaging. Why? Because the conclusion was that recruitment maneuvers don't work. And many, do uh, many doctors just dismissed it on the strength of that excellently intentioned, well-executed, but poorly designed study. Recruitment maneuvers, sham recruitment maneuvers, and you notice basically there's very little sustained improvement in oxygen saturation or in recruiting maneuver compliance values. After a very short period of time, everything returned to baseline, just as I mentioned before. If we look at the starting conditions for this recruiting trial, the causes, first of all, were mainly primary ARDS, pneumonia and aspiration. The plateau pressure starting was already 26 centimeters of water. The PEEP was already almost 14 centimeters of water. And the recruiting pressure that they used was 35 centimeters of water. Returning to this primary ARDS trial, here's the original plateau pressure, here's the recruiting pressure, these are the lung units they could potentially have recruited. And to top it all off, they returned back to the original PEEP. Next case, does not work. A recruiting maneuver, such as they used, is the traditional 40-40 maneuver. And we used to use this as well, because this is what is described in the neonatal literature. And it may work well for neonates, but for adults, I'm not so sure. 30 or 40 seconds, going up to 40 centimeters of water peep. Remember uh, uh, CPAP, I should say. This is well below the pressure we know needs to be applied to fully recruit all of the lung, as I mentioned earlier. Marco Ranieri and colleagues, Grasso, showed that in non-responders, here you have a sustained inflation uh, uh, airway pressure applied to both. In non-responders, there was a hemodynamic uh, cost to pay. Blood pressure fell and cardiac output fell. Cardiac output fell from 10 to 6 liters per minute in the non-responders, did not change in the responders. Those who responded to the recruiting maneuver tended to maintain their cardiac output and actually hemodynamics may dramatically improve as my case example mentioned early on. If you have a right heart strain and you recruit the lung, you may have a dramatic improvement in uh, oxygenation, pH, and afterload. To finish up, I'm gonna show you the results of a recruiting study that we published using three porcine models of acute lung injury to test different types, oleic acid, pneumonia, and pure ventilator-induced lung injury. This could be thought of as a primary form of ARDS, this a secondary form, and this an intermediate form. We use three methods of recruiting the lung, sustained inflation, high-level pressure control, and incremental PEEP, the so-called sustained psi maneuver, where you cap the pressure and you simply increase PEEP and reduce tidal volume. And we use three levels of post-recruitment maneuver PEEP, 8, 12, and 16. All the animals started at 8 centimeters of water. We then returned them either to 8 or to 12 or to 16. Each animal was given those three levels of PEEP. Each animal received the three types of recruiting maneuvers, and we studied three different types of injury, the things that we thought were imp important. Here's an example of sustained inflation and pressure-controlled ventilation. We chose this pattern, two minutes of a pressure identical to the one that was used during sustained inflation, 45 centimeters of water for 40 seconds, 45 over 16 centimeters of water, one to two to IE ratio, so that the cumulative number of cycles, of uh, high stress cycles, would be the same as sustained inflation. The advantages of using the pressure control type of recruiting maneuver, 
using the same recruiting pressure, repeating the maneuvers, multiple maneuvers were applied, lower mean airway pressure, and preserved ventilation, which can be a factor in, in certain individuals over the, over the course of the, uh, the recruitment. We measured volume, but I do not want to talk about that. PCV was slightly better in the volume. Looking at PaO2, the post-recruitment value was totally dependent on positive end expiratory pressure. If we started from eight and returned to eight, there is virtually no effect of the recruiting maneuver after five minutes. If we use 12 or 16, we had sustained improvement. I'm going to go through these quickly because of time. Does the recruitment maneuver add anything to simply increasing the PEEP in this model? And the answer is it depended on the model. The ventilator-induced lung injury model did seem to benefit from the recruiting maneuver. Oleic acid and pneumonia did not seem to benefit much, primarily because pneumonia did not respond to anything, and oleic acid responded to the PEEP level very well. No recruitment maneuver performed well in the pneumonia model, as you can see, at any level of PEEP. And a recruitment maneuver can profoundly depress cardiac output in these anesthetized animals. We're talking about an average of 60% of the baseline cardiac output for each of the models uh, and for recruitment maneuvers, and some of the uh, recovery was delayed 15 minutes after the recruiting maneuver. The recruiting maneuver effect on cardiac output varied among the injury models, with pneumonia being much more susceptible than ventilator-induced lung injury, and oleic acid was intermediate. These were all maintained at the same blood pressure, by the way. The effect of the recruitment maneuver on cardiac output in the pneumonia model was really impressive. With a, with a sustained inflation technique that has traditionally been used, we almost killed our animals. We went down to 35% of cardiac output. The same pressure applied with pressure-controlled ventilation preserved at 70%. Major difference. So the implications, and I'm closing here, Recruitment maneuver effectiveness depends on the injury type, the post-recruitment maneuver PEEP level, and the method in certain settings, the method that we used. Recruiting maneuver hazards are greatest and effectiveness least in the pneumonia-caused acute lung injuries. PCV may be better tolerated than sustained inflation for equivalent effects. Our recommendations are to use PCV in preference to sustained inflation. It's safer. It provides multiple recruiting maneuvers, it's effective, it maintains ventilation, and it's dead simple to, to implement. Monitor hemodynamics during the recruiting interval, repeat recruiting maneuvers after position changes, certain bre uh, circuit breaks, or deterioration of mechanics or oxygenation. Consider multiple recruiting maneuvers in high pressure in refractory cases, and employ prone position and PEEP to consolidate the RM benefit. Recruiting maneuvers are not of proven safety in everyone, do not always work. The best technique may vary between patients and really is unknown in humans. If the recruiting maneuver is positive, it suggests the need for a higher PEEP than you've been using. If it's negative, it should not be continued in the same position, but it should be repeated in the prone position before it's abandoned or conversely repeated in the supine position if you're returning from the prone and repeat after deterioration or, or airway suctioning. I'm not going to go through this case in detail. It's published as a letter. Some doctors from Israel, uh, in response to the ARDSnet uh, paper and my editorial, said, you know something? We had a case of a young man who was dying, and in desperation, they increased positive end expiratory pressure to a very high level. He was already on an FiO2 of 1.0, a peep of 40 centimeters of water using a lung protective strategy, and he was dying. 
And what they did is they went up to pressures as high as 85 to 90 centimeters of water, and the patient recovered after um, a, a brief interval because the only thing that improved his hemodynamics was the recruiting maneuver. My message to you is please be careful, think about what you're doing, monitor what you do, but remember in some cases, the ones that you're losing in particular, and in setting PEEP, the recruiting maneuver may be uh, an essential element of your practice. Thank you very much.